All right, let's call this meeting to order. Uh, this is the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Board of Directors meeting for November 2022. Uh, Donna, may we do a roll call, please? Uh, yes, Director Brown. Present. Director Downing. Present. Director Dutra. Here. Director Colin Terry Johnson. That's here. Uh, Director Koenig. Here. And Director Lynn will be absent today. Director McPherson. Let's Director Myers. Present. Director Pegler. Here. Director Parker. And her. Um, and I do see uh, uh, Director Colin Terry Johnson came on board. Present. And direct, uh, let's see, and Director Rockin. Here. And ex officio Director Henderson. Here. And ex officio Director Northcutt. Do not see her. And I don't see any other board directors that have come on board since. We do have quorum. Thank you. We probably will see a few others arrive here shortly. Yeah. All right. Under announcements, I want to note that today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County, and we appreciate their assistance. Any comments from the Board of Directors prior to the meeting? And items not on the agenda. Seeing none, I'm looking to the public for any comment. I see one hand. Brian from Trail Now. Brian, are you available to speak? Yeah, hi, uh, this is Brian from Trail Now. Thanks uh, for taking the, my time, my comments. Hey, you know, um, I, I wanted to make sure we communicated how great it is that the Metro's plan or objective is to double your ridership. We're fully on board with that. And, and anything we can do to help publicize that, we really want to step forward and do that. You know, me personally, I've been in transportation policy for over 20 years and involved in the RTC for over 20 years, actually, and going to the meetings for over a decade, because I believe in transportation. Um, and you know, what's really important is that we spend our tax dollars effectively. Um, and we really need to drive the money to Metro, get more buses, and do that in, in that sense. Um, and so at this time, I really want to remind everybody about um, what we have in our community, uh, being next to the coastal bluff, we're really restricted on how we invest in our coastal corridor, because essentially it goes 20 feet from the, from the ocean in Manresa, and then over at New Brighton Beach. There's a lot of restrictions, and we've seen that with the California Coastal Commission, where they've actually denied three times request. And so any idea of a fixed rail system running along Manresa and New Brighton is, is really not going to happen. And we shouldn't be uh, spending money on that tax dollars because when we do that, it takes away from Metro, you know, when we waste it. Now understand that in the RFP for the RTC's uh, train proposal, they put horizontal and vertical alignments. And the idea that they're looking at is, well, maybe we'll have it run along the highway. Well, I want to remind the us transportation policy setters that the TCAA study actually I uh, down did not select a train along the highway because it wasn't very effective. It wasn't effective at all. It was actually removed from the plan initially. So the point is, is we really need to use our tax dollars. And one other note is a lot of people believe that the public wants a train. We don't believe that. And even if they did want a train, the public can't have everything they want. Um, in 2004, the public didn't want the high, did not want to widen the highway. Um, one of the things I'll always say is the problem with Santa Cruz infrastructure is it's uh, publicly uh, public opinion rather than the engineers designing the system. And I think we're getting there now with the highway widening and Metro bus on shoulder. So again, I just 
really want to emphasize that I'm hopeful that the Metro representatives for the RTC support Metro and giving funds to Metro because that's what we're going to do. We're really supportive of that. And I really appreciate your guys' time and effort. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I see a hand from Mario. Mario, can you speak, please? I believe you're still muted. Okay. Can you hear there me now? You are. Okay, yes, sorry. Good. That's fine. Uh, I'd like to address the board on a concerning matter that has come to my attention. I'm a bus driver, Watsonville citizen, and travel throughout the community to hear that you're in intentions on cutting the 69A and the 91 from Watsonville is a travesty. You'll be hurting the people that need and use our service for lack of drivers and safety. Why only hurt Watsonville and not other areas in the community? If we are very concerned about driver safety and concerned about the drivers, why is the Metro Planning Board cutting time service for the buses? We had times that ran one hour and 10 minutes for the 71, now we have to do that in 55 minutes. That is not only concerning for drivers, they have to rush throughout the time. They also are getting into more accidents, more incidents. While I continue to see that they want to cut in Watsonville, uh, they want to increase service in Highway 17 and in UCSC. This is cutting into a community in Watsonville that always getting hurt from the Metro. So I want to address that and make sure that you guys think about before you guys cut, you will hurt senior citizens, students, they'll go to Cabrillo, they also go to the mall, they go to the hospital, and that's what I'm gonna say. Thank you, Mario. All right, looking to the public, do I see any additional members of the public who'd like to comment on to the board today? Um, I see an additional hand from Manny. Manny, would you like to speak, please? Can, can you guys hear me? Yes, very good. Hi, I am a, a resident of Watsonville, and I'm also a driver for Santa Cruz Metro, and I too would like to address what um, Mario, I believe, said. You know, I drive the buses, and I also ride the buses, and taking away 91, 69A, I don't think it's a good idea. I, 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 the WC route, I think, could be it eliminated and those you know keep the, these other two routes to keep the same coverage it's just going to affect the people on that corner of watsonville to make one bus to you know santa cruz and the mall i think we need to focus on other things and other areas instead of cutting that the, those two routes we we i've been there for 10 years nearly 10 years and Getting, keeping those two instead of the WC, which we've only had for a year, is a better option. I'd like for you guys to consider that. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Manny, for your comments. All right, another call to the public. If you have any comments to make, uh, I'm seeing no additional hands. So. Mr. Chair, can you can you hear me? All right, I I've been on, but. Uh, I you haven't heard me, so I've been here. Thank you, Bruce. I think I saw you, your name appear somewhere in the attendees yeah. list. So we'll note that uh, both um, Director Kalantari Johnson and Director McPherson are here. Uh, uh, Director Rockin, I see your hand. <clears throat> yes, we, we had um, <clears throat> two comments from members of the public about temporary changes that were um, making um, in routes because of, as a, re, a response to the lack of uh, the shortage of drivers that we're facing. And I wonder if Michael Tree or someone else um, could explain um, what, and so the issue is that uh, we've been leaving a lot of students at UCSC standing, uh, you know, uh, left behind, what are called pass-bys. They're, they're standing at the, and a bus comes by, but it's already full, including people standing, you know, shoulder to shoulder on the bus. Um, my understanding is that we, um, that the, the readjustment that we've done, first of all, it is temporary. It, we're, we're now actually have some good news. We have some classes of uh, training some new drivers that'll allow us to 
reduce the shortage that we've been confronting. But I wonder if someone from the staff might explain. Um, I think the problem is that when we did the, re the realignment or the re <coughs> readjustments, this temporary shift in Watsonville, I don't think the public has maybe fully uh, been uh, educated about what their alternatives are. We didn't stop service anywhere. We basically, we realigned or reorganized how it was delivered temporarily. We'll eventually probably go back to something close to what we have now. But I wonder if someone could explain, you know, how, at least, and I mean briefly, not every route exactly where it's going to go and stuff, but and and what we might be doing to educate the public about the because you know people are used to the bus coming to a certain place at a certain time and that's what they've been doing for years, and if we're changing stuff even temporarily, that may be somewhat of a hardship on people if they don't understand what the new you know where what bus they should be catching now to go to the same place they were going before. Um, so I wonder if someone could explain a little bit about what we've done in terms of that realignment. Yeah, Director Rocket, I can uh, take a stab at that. Thank you. Uh, so the idea that this is a service cut is a is a bit misleading, although it, on paper it does look like the 91X and 69A are being temporarily suspended, which they are. But in their place, three routes are being restructured into one, essentially, that will provide into the 69W, which will provide more frequent service between Watsonville, along Main Street, serving the hospital, and on Cabrillo. There will be essentially no travel time change between Watsonville, Main Street, the hospital, and Cabrillo. It'll be around three to five minutes with a with, because of the deviation, the extra service we're adding to the hospital. Um, but there will be no change in essentially no change in travel time and no change in frequency between those two destinations. So we did that uh, purposefully so that we weren't affecting the, the core riders on that trip, which are between Watsonville and Cabrillo. There will be an impact to customers that travel from downtown Watsonville on the current 91X alignment to downtown Santa Cruz, because that express route will be temporarily suspended. And we think that trip is about 10 to 20 minutes longer on the 71 or 69W, uh, depending on time of day and traffic. We're, we're fully aware that that is gonna inconvenience uh, about 50 uh, trips per day. Uh, with our new APC automatic passenger counter sampling, we're seeing about 50 to 60 trips per day that travel end to end. More than half of the ridership uh, is is between 41st Avenue and Watsonville. This is information uh, that we've sampled over the last couple of uh, months. Um, what else can I, uh, there's an additional change that we're making to the Watsonville circulator to cover uh, Freedom and Airport Boulevard. And so essentially, uh, there is no loss of service or coverage on any corridor that we serve uh, in Watsonville or Santa Cruz. Um, the idea that we're cutting in Watsonville and not in other places is simply not true. Uh, UCSC service has been operating at a deficit uh, throughout COVID, uh, 75 to 80% of pre COVID service. Uh, levels of service. It, it continues to operate at the, the greatest deficit of all the service that we operate uh, in Santa Cruz County. Uh, and Highway 17 also has operated at a deficit throughout COVID. We're currently operating half of the weekday schedule, um, just as ridership has started to come back. And in the winter, we'll continue to operate about half of the weekday schedule. We are cutting uh, service to downtown San Jose so that we can provide a few more trips over the hill. Um, but Watsonville service was the first to be restored fully um, to 100% of pre-COVID levels and even above pre-COVID levels because we launched the Watsonville circulator uh, shortly after. So we had additional service in Watsonville. Um, there was a, a suggestion that we cut that service. This is actually a, a grant funded uh, service on the zero emission buses, the pilot, uh, and so due to the grant, we're, we need to continue to operate that on a fair free basis. Um, we can restructure that route, which is what we're doing now to provide the coverage that we're taking away in the 69A. Um, all of this information, if it's not currently, will be on our website shortly. We also have a fact, uh, frequently asked questions that we put together to explain, you know, what are my options if Watsonville commuter between, uh, between Watsonville and Cabrillo, between Watsonville and downtown, also the Highway 17 changes. And uh, as Director Rockman, as you mentioned, this is these are temporary. You know, we we're still 
it, it feels like we shouldn't be saying this anymore, but we're still coming out of COVID. We're still in a public health emergency, and these are still temporary changes that we need to do to try to make sure we're providing the best service we can to all of our customers. I, I will also note that the, uh, the the fact that we're not serving uh, you know, San Jose State uh, is taken up by the fact that there's actually very incredibly frequent service offered by VTA, uh, our, our partners over the hill, um, that people can make a transfer and it, it's like I think five minutes, you have to may have to wait five or ten minutes, at maybe, I think it's mainly five minutes for the next bus to come along to go to the same place they're going before. And while a transfer is always not quite as good as being able to take, you know, sit in the same seat for a ride. I mean, nobody's nobody's being stopped from getting where they need to go, and, and then nobody's being asked to stand around for a long time waiting for that next bus to come. I appreciate the response, and I, I wonder if we might spend a little bit of uh, additional um, advertising money of some kind just to, because I've gotten a couple calls about this, and I, just to let people in Watsonville know that, you know, this is the way you can get to where you need to go with, for this temporary check shift that we're making. My final question is, when is this all being implemented? It's not happened yet, I take it. No, it's not happened yet. Uh, and due to the a number of changes, we've actually pushed back the start of the winter bid, uh, which is usually the first week uh, in December. It's now the 22nd, right? December 22nd is the first day now. So uh, that'll carry San Jose State through their fall term, uh, Cabrillo as well, before any changes kick in. And over the holidays, we'll be implementing the service change. Thank you so much for the response. I do appreciate it. No problem. Thank you, John. Uh, I saw Alta had a hand up. I think she may have taken it down. Jimmy, I see your hand. Great, thank you. Um, sure. Uh, a few questions. I just, John, just to be to clarify, because I know that um, you know there is a, uh, a a question of equity when it comes to the 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 rerouting, and um, I know I've been working closely with um, Michael and um, on this issue as well. So. Um, we were able to successfully add back in um, Watsonville Hospital into the circulator route so that um, we, if there's no transfer, um, there won't be any, um, you know, extra charge for, for people um, getting to the hospital. Also, um, you will be able to um, find a seat. <laughs> and um, so um, I think that, you know, temporarily this is a, a th this could work out, um, you know, but I think when you, discuss, you know, cutting service, I and mean, you said it happened, it's happening throughout um, the entire um, system. Um, I know we, we talked about that you just discussed about you know, San Jose State University, where else exactly um, are routes going to be cut out, outside of the two um, that we've discussed? So nowhere else this bid. Uh, the point I was trying to make is that since we reduced service uh, at the start of COVID, if you'll remember, we reduced service about 50%. We've slowly been trying to build that back up, right? And, lo and on, on local service, including Watsonville, we, we got back to 100% of the COVID service pretty quickly. And in Watsonville, is, it was even above because we added the Watsonville circulator. Uh, UCSC, on the other hand, operated at about 50 to 60% of pre-COVID service in the beginning. So there was a 40% cut uh, of COVID uh, during COVID. When students returned, we got to about a 25% cut. And we're about, I would say, 20% below pre-COVID today. And so we're, we're, we still are a, a huge deficit. There aren't additional cuts that we're proposing this, uh, this for this winter uh, service change. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to get back to 100% of where we were everywhere, and we still have not done that on Highway 17 or on UCSC. But don't a lot of UCSC's service, doesn't a lot of it depend on the funding that we get from UCSC, which provides for the routes that go into UCSC? Um, yes, and UCSC in the contracts that we renewed last year uh, restored their funding to fully 100%, actually more than pre-COVID levels, uh, that contract, knowing that we couldn't quite restore the service yet, but we were attempting to get there and that we wouldn't be able to if they didn't uh, restore their contract. And they agreed to do that. Um, so the funding is there. The service is not. But I think that during COVID, and if I remember correctly, you know, um, UCSC withheld the funding that, you know, was that Metro was expecting. So there had to be some sort of cuts, if I remember, if I'm remembering this correctly. Yep. 
So um, because they do, their their funding is what pays for the service. That's not the case for Watsonville, right? I mean, so um, we're, we're, we're making a cut to something that um, is not depending on a funding coming directly from those people that live in the community, whereas at UCSC, the funding is coming from the students. So, um, I, you know, I just, I just encourage everybody to, you know, keep that in mind. You know, this is not an apple. This is not apples and apples and apples. It's that's two completely situ different situations. Um, and you know, I'm glad that we're able to work, you know, some things out. But it's at the end of the day, um, you know, it's a community that's considered disadvantaged in many ways, and um, you know, make taking routes away from. Um, that community uh, doesn't, you know, the optics doesn't look so great to the community. So um, I, uh, I I just want to say thank you to Michael for, you know, helping, you know, work out, so, you know, some of the glitches that we had. But um, I, I just, I really have a hard time when we start comparing the two routes, UCSC and Watsonville to get, you know, because they're different and um, the funding is different. And so um, I, uh, um, hope that, you know, we can get back, you know, really soon to, uh, you know, regular service, hopefully, uh, you know, three to six months. And, I, you know, I think anything longer will, um, you know, really cause a bigger, you know, concern in the community. So I don't know if you have any comments on that. Just the, the UCSC contract pays for fares. And so the, the amount that we receive from UCSC allows students, faculty, and staff to ride for free on the buses. So the contract, the, you're right, in 2020 when COVID hit, uh, they withheld the contract money for the remainder of 2020. And then in 2021, there was a reduced amount um, at fiscal year 2021. But in fiscal year 2022, they restored fully the pre-COVID levels of service and they committed to doing that for the next five years. And that money pays for fares. Uh, it doesn't pay for service. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a little bit different, but it's essentially that uh, it, it's not as different as I think it seems. Um, and so we're still, the greatest deficit of all of our service compared to pre-COVID is still the UCSC and Westside routes, even with these changes that we're implementing in winter. You're, but your point taken, it looks like, it sounds like we're making lots of cuts. The amount of service and revenue hours being provided to Watsonville uh, is being reduced slightly, but compared to pre-COVID, it's the same because we added the Watsonville circulator. All that is to say, hiring is looking good in the next three to six months. I think we can restore uh, the 91X to what it was. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mike, uh, Director, oh, yeah, can I, I see your hand yeah. up? I don't want to prolong this, and I take Jimmy's point. Um, obviously, we all would like to restore ser full service as quickly as possible. Um, I just want to say, we it's 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 misleading when people say UCSC students ride for free. They're paying the highest transit fee of any students in the United States of America right now. They they uh, voted to impose that fee upon themselves because I think mainly they believe in environmental issues that. Um, as well as wanting to have you know the service, but the, to be fair, it's not free. It's just they collect, they're buying their tickets collectively, you know, together. Um, and the university then the university takes the, all the money that they're giving them and pays us with that money. But it's not a free ride. It's just not paid. If the, when you walk in the door of the bus, you show your card, and so it's like it might look like it's free, but they're paying a fee that's pretty pretty high. And um, so nobody should sort of assume that they're getting away with something here. It's not the case at all. Thank you for that clarification, Director Rockton. And in fact, you know, every student pays at UCSC, even those who don't ride, uh, pay other students transit fares, essentially. But you're right. They all pay. Uh, it's not free to any of them. All right. I see a hand up from our public member, Daniel Dodge. Dan, would you like to speak, please? Yeah. Yes, I would. And can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Go right ahead. Good morning. My name is Daniel Dodge Sr., I might I might add. Um, and I just wanted to be able to address the, the subject really quick. Um, I, I know that it's, um, I, I was previously served on the Santa Cruz Metro Board. I know it's a, a numbers game at times. But when you're talking about reducing service to the 69A and the 91X, um, this just directly affects um, the community where I reside, you know, my neighbors, my, my family. Um, this, the, 
these routes are our lifebloods to people to get to work, accessibility to health care, accessibility to employment, accessibility to education. And so when we're talking and, and the buzzwords that are used around the county and other institutions, such as the one that I work at for the college formerly known as Cabrillo, um, diversity, equity, inclusion are always a, a driving factor in things here. Um, in the way we, we're trying to do uh, business and live our lives here in Santa Cruz County. So when you're making uh, uh, changes to these, and, and no offense to any, any of the Metro staff, you're, you're, no, you're no, um, noticed to the public by posting something on the website. You're talking about a community that has ex access issues to be even to get to uh, internet or, or your website. And these are the folks that are writing the 69A, the 91X. Um, so uh, you're, while it seems like a, a number crunch uh, at times to be able to move things around, you're directly affecting, affecting people who reside, work, raise families in, in, in our community. And so any kind of changes to those, uh, those routes, um, and no, I don't believe, you know, uh, I believe there's been sufficient no uh, notice to be able to these changes, uh, even on a temporary basis. Um, are, 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 they could, they could have damaging consequences. And, and this is with the, the, the Santa Cruz Metro, um, has a, has a, has always had a loyal ridership in the city of Watsonville here in the South and also here in the South County. So, uh, I, I would just, uh, um, it appears that these are already moving forward, but I, 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 I would like to echo the sentiment of my community and residents that these routes actually cause um, cause harm to to folks in a minority majority community that relies on the Santa Cruz Metro uh, as, as their access point to all the things that I described above. So thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. Thank you, Daniel. All right, I'm looking once more for any hands or comments, and I'm seeing none. Any final words from um, staff or directors on this? We'll move along. Just a quick comment. I, I'm sure, John. I, I only mentioned posting changes on the website. We will post uh, notices at every affected bus stop, uh, at the bus stop itself. Uh, Danielle can chime in on our other channels, um, but we will make these changes known through all of all of our channels. It's obviously not just the electronic communications. It's translated. All of our messages are translated into English and Spanish, and we'll be we will be posting physical notices at every affected bus stop. Thank you, John. All right, uh, I believe we're going to move on to the next item, and that would be labor organization communications. Do we have anything from our labor representatives today? I'm looking for a hand up. I'm not seeing anything. All right, we'll move on. Uh, Metro Advisory Committee, any communications from that group, Donna? Don't think so? No, yes, there are none. All right. Uh, finally, the additional documentation to support existing agenda items. I know, Donna, you sent out uh, <coughs> one email, I believe, just a, a sample of a follow-up. Um, that was to the board this morning. All right. Correct. All right. The next item is the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda that uh, directors care to have Discussed, pulled from approval. Um, I see a hand from Rebecca, Director Downing. Yes, I was looking at the schedule for next year and saw that there were meetings in both Scotts Valley and Watsonville. So I'd like to propose that we consider having one meeting at the Community Foundation in Aptos. Thoughts, That's comments, it. folks? Okay. I'm not sure of the process that's uh, put in place for uh, scheduling where and where the meetings occur, um, but perhaps our staff can look at that. Yeah, that's all. I just uh, just would like to throw that in because it's that sort of mid county and the facilities available. Yeah, I think we've held meetings at the Capitola City Hall, mm -hmm. City Council Chamber. That worked too. Yeah, that would work too. Yeah. We have had them there in the past. That's been our other mid-county point. Cool. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And uh, just so that you know, um, so we have various entities listed in our bylaws that we reach out to. 
And I did reach out to the Capitola uh, city clerk to see if we could schedule a, a meeting there in 2023. Um, at this time, they are not allowing outside entities to reserve space in their chamber. Um, they weren't sure how they were gonna be handling the governor's notice of um, uh, the suspension of the state of emergency. Yeah, I couldn't tell from the bylaws if there were restrictions to specific sites. So uh, maybe we can look at that too. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that item, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. We'll look into that further. Uh, were there any items on the consent agenda the public was concerned of? I see no <clears throat> hands. I have a hand up. Jimmy, I see it now. Thank you. Bouncing back and forth from attendees. It kind of blends into the sky, the sky there too. Sorry. I just wanted right. to say thank you um, in regard to the meetings, bringing them back to our um, you know, individual jurisdictions because I mean, this was a big problem that I had last time when I was, um, when we took them away. Uh, you know, a lot of people can't travel outside of um, their communities. So this gives an opportunity for people to um, at least attend one meeting a year in either, you know, Watsonville, Santa Cruz, um, Scotts Valley, um, that where it makes it convenient for them. So I, I really, I appreciate this. I don't know if Michael, if you were behind this or, or who was, but whoever was, thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Yes, and it will be good to see all of you in person again. I'll move approval of the consent agenda. We have a motion. From second. Hopkins. The second was from Manu. Manu, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any comment from the public? All right, maybe we vote on this, please, Donna. Director Brown. Aye. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Yes, okay. yes, sorry. <laughs> Director Colentary Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. Not here. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. Thank you all. That brings us to our regular agenda. And the first item is a resolution of appreciation for a uh, retiring bus operator, uh, Lenore Baldwin. Uh, Lenore, since Lenore started with the Metro 10 years ago, she's taken the responsibilities of bus operation very seriously, including her service to the community and riders. She will be missed for her participation in many employee events where she spent time making every occasion a success with her special touch. Lenora will be spending her time enjoying Santa Cruz County with her husband, Dennis, who also is a retired bus operator. We wish her well and thank her for her many positive contributions to operations. With that we have a uh, uh, resolution for appreciation we need to uh, take from the board here. There's a motion in a second. I see a motion from Rocket. I'll second. I'll second. I think I saw Rebecca. All right, we have a motion and a second. May we roll call on this appreciation. Director Brown. Aye. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Yes. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director McPherson. Oh. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Great. And thank you, Lenore, for your 10 years of service. Very much appreciated. Our next item, a presentation of safety certificates of achievement for the first quarter ending September 30th of 22. Um, this is interesting. Major safety milestone of zero incidents, over 1,300 accident incident-free days in the following departments. So there are five of them, administration, finance, grants and planning, human resources, and information technology. And we also have, and, and I hope someone might help explain this a bit more, most hours of service during COVID pandemic. Uh, and four individuals, Miguel 
Escarcega Jr., Mario Espinosa, Yoriel Mendoza, and Ruben Valdez. Um, do we do something here, Donna? Do we have an action or? Uh... Uh, no action is required. Uh, I believe Curtis Moses is online if great. you'd like him to speak a little to the topic. That'd be great. Curtis, could you elaborate a little bit more about this? Sure. Um, uh, good morning, uh, members. Uh, we recognize five different departments in this quarter with uh, zero accidents and incident over 1,300 days, that's equivalent to four years plus without having even a, a scratch or even a needing of a Band-Aid. So this major accomplishment was uh, definitely recognized and one of the highest, most achievements for uh, safety in a, any type of industry. So we recognized those five departments. And also, uh, similar to what other transit agencies are doing across the country, now that we're starting to get COVID in the rearview mirror, uh, transit agencies are now uh, recognizing the hard work and dedication of frontline employees and are giving them some recognitions uh, uh, transporting the, the public during the COVID times. And what we did with here, we recognized four employees that had uh, one employee had over 5,000 hours of, of service during COVID, and as well as some of the other operators had 4,000 hours. So the safety department wanted to recognize these four employees for uh, in gratitude uh, for their service. Wow, that's terrific, Curtis. Thank you to the, all the, the staff who've put that together and, and staying safe. I appreciate it very much. You're here. Mr. Chair, should, should we write a letter of thanks or congratulations to those four? Or do you think it, there's many people involved, I know, but- uh, Very good question. Uh, Michael, would you have a suggestion on that? Yeah, you know, we certainly could write a, a letter. They, they did receive a very nice plaque and we presented it to them um, kind of at a company lunch. Um, so there was some recognition in regard to a plaque and, and uh, recognition in front of their peers. But uh, yeah, if it's the board's desire, we could certainly do that as well as just a, right. kind of a, a finishing yeah. touch on that. Uh, Rebecca, I see your hand up. Comment, question? Perhaps, perhaps we could do a press release with a photograph of them for the power union and the sense. That sounds like a good idea. Fantastic. Very good. Any other comments from the staff? Well, we'll let the uh, the staff work on, on those ideas. And uh, directors, any other remarks, comments on this? Good work, everyone. I appreciate that. It's really great to see that kind of performance and record and safety. All right. Item 12, um, consideration to approve accepting Metro's updated Title VI program. That's going to be from uh, Julie Sherman, I believe. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Right. It is the every three year submission to the FTA where we take a fresh look at Metro's Title VI policy and service standards policy, make any updates that are required by law. And we also just take a fresh look, you know, because you just see things that you could improve. So this year, my civil rights team worked with Ricky Ann, and Ricky Ann did a great job reviewing the policy. We did not make any revisions to the Title VI policy and service standards policies. Those were in great shape. We did, however, update another a, a number of other sections of the program. We reviewed and updated all of the exhibit documents to confirm they met with all legal requirements. We updated the Title VI complaint form and process, and we the main um, revisions we made were to the language assistance plan. We updated the LAP so that each of the four factors in the four-factor framework analysis reflect all current legal requirements set forth in the FTA's Title VI circular. Um, now, typically, we provide the board with revisions However, the, the revisions to the LAP were so extensive and went through so many iterations that we just didn't think it made sense to put that in the packet because it would just confuse everyone. 
So we have clean versions, but if anybody's interested in seeing those, you know, I'm happy to share those with anyone, you know, from the board and the public. Uh, but please rest assured all they are doing, you know, is, is just reflecting what's required from the Title VI circular. Um, we didn't, you know, we're not going off and doing our own thing. Um, so that that's a basic summary of what we did, and we're looking for the board to approve this policy so we can send it to the FTA. Thank you, Julie. Uh, any questions from the directors? Uh, yes. Mike Rotkin. Julie, could you take just a moment to explain? I mean, the board members know this, but the public may not. What is Title VI and what have we, you know, accomplished here? Thank you. Of course. Um, so, yeah, so Title VI is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which pro prohibits discrimination against any individual or group on the basis of race, color, or national origin under any program. Now, Metro is a grantee of the federal government, in, in this case, the FTA, and the FTA has oversight over Metro's uh, you know, system and services to make sure that Metro is not discriminating against any individuals that are listed in Title VI. And so every three years, no, well, I mean, all the time, Metro's making sure that's the case. And we have a Title VI policy that we follow anytime there are service changes, fare changes, you know, route changes. We have to make sure we're not discriminating. This kind of goes back and ties into the earlier discussion about the changes in Watsonville. And so every three years, we review what we've done during that three-year period. We look at any complaints we received from folks that say, hey, you're discriminating against me because of X, Y, and Z. We have to analyze those complaints, make sure they actually fall under Title VI because they may not. For example, someone might say, you discriminated against me um, because I had a dog or something that wouldn't fall under Title VI, but that might fall under a different policy. And then we have to respond to those complaints. We have to make sure that we are providing appropriate translation of key documents so that folks that may not speak English as their first language are, are able to access the services that Metro provides. So it's a whole program of policies and procedures to make sure Metro is not discriminating. And so every three years, we have to check all of that make any changes, any improvements, and any and check any updates to the law that happened during that three-year period. We make those changes and we send it to the FTA, and then the FTA will review. If they find anything wrong with what they've done, they'll let us know and we can make further changes. I don't anticipate that to happen here, um, and it's okay if it does, and we'll just make further changes, and then the FTA will approve our program for that three-year period looking ahead. Thanks, that was really helpful. I think and FTA is Federal Transit Administration for those that may not know. Thank you, Julie. Good question, Mike. Any other comments from the directors? I'm also looking to the public and uh, any comment that might come from them. I'm not seeing any hands rise. All right, we do have, we need an action here to approve this. I'll move it if nobody else is moving. Move approval. Second. I see Shebra as a second, Rotkin as uh, our motion. All right, Donna, uh, roll call, please. Okay, Director Brown. Aye. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colentary Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this, Julie. All right. Our next item is the oral report from our CEO, Michael Tree, and COVID-19 update. Michael, what's the news? All right. Hear me okay, Chair Pavner? Yes. All right. Well, I'll start off with uh, the COVID-19 update. Um, I think we're faring okay. Um, we've had five new cases since we last met, but none of the divisions that uh, are within Metro are currently in a minor outbreak status, which was kind of the 
a lingering status that we had, uh, you know, over the last six months or so. So, uh, you know, I think we're, we're faring well, uh, not seeing a huge impact. Um, I think the next most important thing to talk about is your new operators. Um, we graduated going into this weekend seven uh, of the nine that we had in training as new operators. Uh, the other two will be closely behind. So that's really exciting news to get seven new operators out on the road. Uh, it's balanced with the, the thought, well, with the fact that we've lost six operators to retirement over the last six months and a couple of other reasons. So, you know, uh, it's dampened a bit, but we're still moving in the right direction. There's still a net positive number of operators. Um, just looking forward, we're kind of looking at this in six months increments. Over the next six months, we've got uh, uh, 12 new operators that will be starting actually later this month in class and in the training. So we're really hopeful, you know, to have good results and to not have any um, of those 12 drop, uh, doing everything that we can to keep them and support them. Um, that's balanced against the outlook of six additional operators over the next six months, excuse me, five additional operators over the next six months retiring or leaving uh, the agency. But following those 12 that will be in training, uh, you know, we'll begin very soon advertising all over again and hopeful to have another class right behind. And so, you know, my thought, my hope, my goal is to, to get back to where we can restore that service that uh, we've talked about uh, this morning. Um, I had a couple of other things that were kind of high on the radar. Uh, certainly the newspaper article about uh, the goals, the three goals that we have uh, at Metro that we talked about in the workshop and the most prominent and important of those goals is obviously ridership, not only getting our recovery done, but going beyond and doubling the ridership uh, based on uh, this year is kind of a base year. That would get you to 7 million rides in five years. And uh, I thought it might be worth uh, just a couple of seconds to talk about that goal, because uh, you may have uh, received some questions from neighbors or colleagues about that goal, it's ambitious, and uh, you know, it's it, quite frankly that that's why we like it. It's going to be tough to reach, but we we see a path, and so we don't mind setting that goal high if we see a path. And basically, the path to get there would involve uh, what people want in public transit. You saw it in the uh, public survey that we did uh, going into the workshop. People want frequency in the bus system on key corridors. They want speed and they want reliability. Uh, and so looking at the routes, we've got a comprehensive operational uh, analysis that you'll approve, hopefully, uh, the contract for that at your next board meeting in December, and also a long-range plan built into that kind of a blueprint, if you will, of improvements that will follow uh, that look at the routes. So we'll move towards that, uh, that frequency, that speed, and that reliability, what folks need and, and want, um, hopefully during those planning efforts. The other two uh, areas that will allow us to really make leaps in ridership, obviously Watsonville. Uh, John and I talk a lot about Watsonville and the opportunities in Watsonville. And um, also with the university, uh, both the university and Cabrillo College and other students like junior high and high school students. Um, so if you kind of look at those areas, John and I felt comfortable with that ridership goal. Um, again, it's 7 million within five years to get, get us to 7 million. And you haven't been there in about 20 years. So uh, we're all excited about it and, and wanting to, to move forward with it. Um, I mentioned that COA and the long range plan, uh, we got great response uh, from uh, consultants on wanting to do that work. We've graded their proposals and we're kind of in the final stages of getting a recommendation uh, to you in December. Just a, a couple of other items um, we're working on. Um, well, actually I'll back up just a second. Um, I'm hopeful that you had a chance to review your key performance indicators that were in your consent calendar. Um, everything's going in the right direction. I mean, your, your ridership on your fixed route is up 33% over the first quarter last year. And your ridership on paratransit, you are done with the recovery and going beyond that. And, and it's 30% up over the first quarter of last year and comparing first quarters. So, you know, it's exciting and, and we're riding that enthusiasm and is quite frankly, a lot of our challenges on routes is, is managing pass-bys that are generated from full buses. 
So um, just a couple of other things. We've got a major grant opportunity coming up. It's called the Transit Inner City Rail Capital Program. So we're working really closely with CalSTA, which is over transportation at the state level on our grant application. Uh, it's really a, a dive into hydrogen buses, hydrogen, a hydrogen fueling station. Um, and we've also packaged into that grant thus far some housing elements uh, to move housing forward as we talked about in our workshop. So all in all, it'll be about a $35 million grant application and we're working really closely with the state on that. So you have not received uh, funding from the TERSA program, uh, I believe in seven cycles. Um, and so you're due. And so we're making sure that everybody in Sacramento, including those who represent us in the Senate and the Assembly, know that this is an important ask that we have coming up in the near future. Um, I think I have just one other thing, really, uh, and that is that, you know, we continue to be active in the community. Uh, Danielle certainly worked hard uh, during um, you know, uh, October, as we got close to uh, trick-or-treat time, uh, we did two activities. Uh, the first one was with uh, the uh, county sheriff's department. We helped them with their truck, trunk or uh, treat event. Uh, we provided shuttle service and helped a, a few hundred people get between Capitola Mall and the sheriff's headquarters where the event was held. And then the other one was with the county probation office and their trunk or treat event at the Watsonville Fairgrounds. And so, you know, we continue to have a lot of fun with the community and we're looking for ways, uh, obviously, to, to even grow closer to the community uh, in regard to uh, being a great transit system and being their hometown system here in the county. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll just see if there's any questions. Questions from our directors. Mike. Um, Michael, is there anything board members could be doing to help lobby our uh, state elected officials on that um, grant that we're looking to receive? Um, I mean, it might be, I'll leave it to you to decide. I mean, maybe that's a process that doesn't need our input, but if it does, maybe you could send us talking points and, um, you know, set us loose. And <laughs> I don't mind calling our state officials and, and uh, you know, educating them about our needs here. Yeah, that's fantastic. This this grant's due in February, and we're working with CalSTA to kind of tidy up what will exactly be in the grant, the details. Um, it's aligning nicely with their goals. So I like that offer, uh, Director Rotkin, and uh, yeah, I'll reach out to, to board members to strategically, um, you know, make contributions there as far as advocacy there in Sacramento. Thanks. Yep. Thanks for Any the report, too, as well. Yes. Any other questions or comments from the directors? Looking at the public as well, if there's any comments from the attendees, seeing none. That's very good, Michael. I appreciate the uh, updates. Glad to hear that the uh, next class has a dozen folks in it. That will be uh, welcome and we get them through everything. All right. I think that brings us to announcement of our next meeting, which will be on Friday, December 16th, again, via teleconference, just as we're doing it today. And uh, unless there are any final comments, we're about to adjourn. And with that, I think we're adjourned. <laughs>